Because so many people learn doctrine by the subtle messages of the songs they sing, the actual words of the text must be honest, in complete conformity with Scripture. Then all the implied ideas must be examined to make sure that no ambiguity exists. Let's look at several examples of textual compromise to give us handles for evaluating the words of a song. As we review these examples, bear in mind that we are striving to learn fine discernment in our music choices. We are not going to deal with songs that have blatant doctrinal violations in them, though. There may be times in these examples when you feel we are splitting hairs, but our concern is that error is often so subtle that it can lead a listener to a wrong assumption without him even being aware of why he thinks as he does. Parents of the 1950s were, I think, the most unusual generation of the 20th century. These are the people who had grown up in the Depression. They had experienced real tough times when they were children and when they were teenagers. And then World War II hit, as many of them were just reaching adulthood, and they had the trauma of the war. And then, after all that, they reached the 1950s at a time when the U.S. was tremendously prosperous, when the economy was booming as we've never seen it before. And I think they reacted to that prosperity, and they think, I think they reacted strongly to all of the trauma of the Depression and the war by turning inward a bit, by marrying young, by emphasizing home and family. The 1950s was a moment in time where conformity ruled. It was a period where people wanted to live up to societal standards based on Christian principles. It created an atmosphere of a secular world being divided into the good folks and the bad folks, with the Christian community creating a set of rules and codes to abide by. Anyone will make a good appearance if he's neat no matter what his style of clothing. Clothes are important. Besides fitting well and looking well, the clothes should be appropriate to the occasion. Wearing inappropriate clothes, like these shoes, is a sure way to make yourself uncomfortable and conspicuous. But good grooming is more than clothes deep. Good grooming starts with personal care. This principally means the care of your hands, your hair, your teeth, and your skin. The rules stated that Christian men must have short hair and that women must wear dresses. No one could listen to music with a jungle beat or go to the movies. Come down here from New York and from Florida to, to find out my reasons on rock and roll music and why I preach against it, and I believe with all of my heart, that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. I 100% believe it. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels when you sing it. I know what it does to you. And I, I know uh, the evil feeling that you feel when you sing it. I know the, the, the lost position that you get into in the beat. Well, uh, if you talk to the average teenager of today and you ask them what it is, about rock and roll music that they like, and they'll, the first thing they'll say is the beat, the beat, the beat. The most prevalent textual problem in any music is humanism. Every one of us is much more influenced by humanism than we begin to realize. Our education system is saturated with humanism. The media bombards us with it at every turn. But humanism is not a new thing. We see its influence in the Garden of Eden. King Solomon observed it in Ecclesiastes that there is no new thing under the sun when it comes to the vanity of man without God. No good Christian man would drink, smoke, or date girls that do. I was supposed to be a lady. Um, I can remember having black patent shoes and little white socks, and I had to wear white gloves. Um, we went to church every Sunday, and I had to wear dresses and and gloves. I was taught that um, a lady is, is always a lady and that I was always to be a lady and that meant um, no, not to um, play with horseplay. Um, I wanted to be a tomboy. I wanted to go out and, and climb trees and, and hike in the woods and, and do the things that the boys did, but, um, but I, I, was, I was somewhat limited in being able to do that. And what did girls feel was in store for them? A life just like their mothers. Educational films like this one reflect society's belief that women could find fulfillment only as housewives and mothers. Now I let it come to a full rolling boil again. You like to cook, don't you, pet? 
Oh, it's not just liking to cook. It's, it's more. It's, well, it's accomplishing something. It's me cooking. Me, Susan Douglas. And not just cooking, but, well, creating something special. Even girls who were sent to college often majored in what were called the domestic sciences. Oh. <laughs> well, there's one nice thing about it happening in class. Here is part of our learning. At home, it would be a minor tragedy. There was a song when I went to college at Smith College, which they don't sing anymore, I know, that had a verse that went something like this. You're sharp as a pinpoint. Your grades are really ten point. You are Dean's Lissafia Smith. But when a man wants a kiss kid, he doesn't want a quiz kid. Oh, you can't get a man with your brains, with your brains, with your brains. Oh, you can't get a man with your brains, with your brains, with your brains. Oh, you can't get a man with your brains. But the world in which Christians knew it would change, there was a problem. The counterculture movement and the sex revolution was picking up some steam, and youth would find themselves breaking free from the chains of conformity. Well, it seems to me we've never been in a greater mess in our lives as a nation. Here we, we've spent $677 billion in three wars in this century alone, and we're in the shadow of a third world war. We venture upon all sorts of international arrangements and infinite palaver to bring peace and security, and the United Nations is not united, if we're honest about it, but thoroughly disunited. We have a lack of discipline that manifests itself in a wave of juvenile delinquency, in a, a, a difficulty in training soldiers for the hard discipline of war, in a variety of ways that mean, for example, broken homes with divorces, one out of four, one out of five marriages broken in that way. It seems to me right there is a good proof. And you say that theology has no place. Well, of course, I, when I reused the word theology, I wasn't referring to a fully developed theology in the sense that a theologian would talk about it. But I'm talking about respect for God and God-fearingness God instead of godlessness. Why, that's been an implicit tradition in our whole American system. Every American, idea every American president has talked about it. We talk on our coins of in God we trust. It seems to me that once you take that absolute out of it, then you are left only with men. And then the question is, which man? The dictator or the man who's powerful? It seems to me that if you take God out of the picture, then man alone is responsible for the difference between right and wrong. Professor Hodges, I, I want to take some exception here. Uh, here are a lot of assumptions that progressive education has caused three wars, uh, inability of the United States to function. I'd like to ask about Italy, which has juvenile delinquency, piled on juvenile delinquency, and has a background such as you apparently want. Now, I think... Well, I, I'm not Butler, interested in defending other systems that failed either. I'm talking about one system that failed in this country. I, I, I don't think it's failed. I think that you have ample opportunity to bring your children up if parents want to face their responsibilities. But you're advocating that this be turned over to the state and you blame uh, progressive I'm not education. I'm advocating that it be turned over to the state. Well, no, the, 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 As a matter of fact, the question was asked, which religion should be chosen? I say the parents. With the growing rate of youth rebellion, the nation ran into a problem and questioned which religion should be chosen as the blueprint and umbrella in how society should operate. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act, and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote, where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference, and where no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president who might appoint him or the people who might elect him. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope the National Council of Churches, or any other ecclesiastical source. When no religious body seeks to impose its will, directly or indirectly, upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials, and where religious liberty is so indivisible that an act against one church is treated as an act against all, at this point, Darwinism and secular humanism had dominated the education in the universities for nearly 30 years. 
The educators graduated attorneys, judges, and politicians, not to mention teachers and university professors who were fairly well-schooled in socialism and intent on creating a new utopia for mankind. John Dewey, in his book, A Common Faith, wrote this about humanism. Here are all the elements for a religious faith that shall not be confined to sect, class, or race. The Humanist Manifesto I proclaimed, the time has come for widespread recognition of the radical changes in religious beliefs. In every field of human activity, the vital movement is now in the direction of a candid and explicit humanism, religious humanism. Over the previous 30 years, the country had lived on the borrowed capital of Christian morals, or what has been called a Christian hangover. By 1961, the Supreme Court referred to secular humanism as a religion a religion that is in direct conflict with the founding document of the United States. Recently, however, some secular humanists have denied that their worldview is religious. As the dogma of the separation of church and state has spread throughout the courts, humanists have sought ways to retain their presence in the public schools. If secular humanism were viewed as a religion, then it too would lose access to the minds of America's youth. Paul Kurtz, publisher of Prometheus Books and author of The Humanist Manifesto II, argues that secular humanism is neither a religion nor is it religious in character. Humanism provides a kind of cosmic outlook. What I mean is it's a tentative interpretation of nature based upon the sciences. It's always changing and open to modification in the light of new evidence. So no, I don't think that's religious or a religion. Christians, however, would have a different opinion. There is another worldview that is actually universal in its religious appeal. It is the enemy of all organized religion because it masquerades as a non-religion. However, there's no such thing as a non-religion because all worldviews are religious in nature. In fact, worldviews are essentially defined by their perception of God. This non-religion religion is known as secular humanism which can be defined as a religion where man is his own God. Secular humanism advances the lie that there is no need for God. It should make sense that its most hated target would be that religion which offers the truth about God and how he loves the world so much that he was willing to come die for it. Christianity places Jesus as God in the center of all things. But secular humanism places man at the center of the universe. Man is in control. It's man and his world. Christianity puts its faith in God's creative ability and purpose, but secular humanists, they put their faith in institutions that are advancing man's central position within that world. It's not God's central position, but man's central position that is being constantly advanced and reinforced through secular humanism. To the secular humanists, Truth is not absolute. It's a matter of opinion or whatever someone, anyone, had determined is good for them. Yet there seems to be no lack of enthusiasm for pushing this invented position upon others, often with the zeal that makes it the most virulent of religions. Even though secular humanism may promote itself as not being a religion, the reality is that it is a religion as it is a belief system indeed a belief system of very strong convictions. By 1962, the Supreme Court banned Bible reading and prayer from the public classroom. First question at President Kennedy's news conference deals with the Supreme Court decision that a New York school prayer violates constitutional separation of church and state. The president's statement is in the nature of an effort to calm the storm over the decision. Well, I haven't seen the measures in the Congress, and you'd have to make a determination of what the language was and what the effect it would have on the First Amendment. The uh, Supreme Court uh, has made its judgment. A good many people uh, obviously will disagree with it. Others will agree with it. But I think that uh, it is uh, important for us, if we're going to maintain our constitutional principle, that we uh, support uh, Supreme Court decisions, even when we may not agree with them. In addition, we have, in this case, a very easy remedy and that is to pray ourselves. And I would think that uh, it would be a welcome reminder to every American family that uh, we can uh, pray a good deal more at home, we can attend our churches with a good deal more uh, fidelity, and uh, we can make uh, 
the true meaning of prayer much more important in the lives of all of our children. That power is very much open to us. And I would hope that uh, as a result of this decision that uh, all American parents uh, will intensify their efforts at home. These decisions rocked the Christian community. The world that they had wanted to ignore was invading their sanctuary, forcing them to pay attention. From the Christian perspective, all went downhill from there. The 60s is a crazy time. I was born on March 25th, uh, 1960. I'm black and bird. The 60s had to be age of innocence lost. Good! The 60s were a monumental error in time that upset the Christian community greatly. There were many events that contributed to the social turmoil and to the fears of the traditional and law-abiding Americans. How long do you think Beatlemania will last? As long as you all keep coming. The Beatles are great! All they had with says so! The Beatles are great! They're great! I love them. I don't care what anybody thinks. I love the Beatles for them, and I'll always love them. Even when I'm 105 and an old grandmother, I love them. And Paul McCartney, if you are listening, Adrian from Brooklyn loves you with all her heart. I love you, Paul, and please come to the window so I can just see you. I saw you smoking before, and I kissed the limousine and you looked at him. But I love you, and I want you, Paul. Please look at him. And Ringo, you can look at him, too, because I like you. There have been huge crowds of teenage girls outside complaining that they don't want to mob you, they just want to speak to you. What do you think about this? Do you want to talk to them? Well, have you ever tried talking to about 200 people at once? <laughs> We'd love to, you know. We never, we, if we all wave and somebody always says, stop that waving, you're inciting them. Why do you like them so much? I don't know, there's just something about them. I don't know when they sing. Aren't they as good as anybody else? No, they're better. This decade became the crossroad intersection with no stop signs where the competing worldview and philosophies were about to collide. The baby boom era would raise a generation in a permissive society that seemed to be getting out of control. The 1960s youth problem was described as an entire generation that had been turned into a bunch of spoiled, narcissistic brats. And it allowed um, for a whole generation that I suppose we would now call spoiled, spoiled kids, which from another point of view simply meant kids who had very high expectations in life with respect to freedom and happiness. They thought life was about being free and about being happy. And they carried those expectations forward into high school and into college uh, and brought with them a kind of um, um, uh, a level of expectation that was simply unprecedented in, I, I would say, in world history. People growing up in the 60s were looked at as unappreciative kids who didn't value the sacrifice, work ethic, or morals of their parents. We found out in the 50s that if you got up in the morning and went to work and did a good day's work, uh, that things got better. You got promoted or you got more money, uh, you were able to buy furniture, you could have more children, the children could have better clothes, and life just improved. We knew it was because you went to work. But I'm not sure our children realized that. They saw simply that the clothes got better, the house got bigger, the, the neighborhood got nicer. And I have a strong suspicion that what happened in the late 60s was that the kids who rebelled took it for granted that life would improve automatically. There was no longer just one kind of family that's okay to live. Back in the 50s, there was one dominant model, the nuclear family in, with, in which the husband went to work and the wife stayed home. That's now changed. Americans are much more tolerant of people who lived together before they married. They're much more tolerant of single parent families. They're much more tolerant of families of remarriage. And in fact, they're much more likely to live in all those different family settings, much more likely to than in the early 50s. The 60s gave us tolerance. It gave us a sense that there are alternative possibilities. And for better or worse, we're living with that in our family life. Sex became pulled apart from marriage during the 1960s. During the early years of the 1960s, for most women at least, a first sexual experience would likely be with the person you're going to marry, and maybe not until after you married him. By the end of the decade, that's much less common, and certainly as we get into the 70s, increasingly less common. It used to be the case that sex was something that was associated primarily with marriage, at least for the middle class. By the end of the decade, it was something that was much more of an individual choice, that had much less to do with whether you were married or not, and much more to do with how you felt what your own reactions were, and much less to do with a sense of obligation or constraints imposed by others. 
The hippie love rebellion characterized youth idealism. All traditional moral values were questioned by the young, as they were in favor of the new moral values. This created a dynamic of the new generation versus the old. The younger generation judged the older generation's morality by their new enlightened moral system. How could the older generation make a claim to morality, they thought. If the older generation allowed materialism, racism, and sexism to flourish under their watch, then how could they be moral? There are two worlds of teenagers. I, myself, have a younger sister who's 15, and I know that her world is completely different from mine. The younger ones seem to be living in a world of tension and, and great anxiety, partly due to the world situation that is existing today. They're in a rush for everything. They start drinking at parties when they're in eighth grade. They um, consider sex nothing at all. There is, a, there is a teenage world. You know, if the adults don't like it, that's only because they don't want to be a part of it. That's, that's their tough luck. It's different. There's always a change going on. You never know what's going to happen next. You never know what new clothes you're going to have. You never know what the new records are going to be. My stack of records keeps getting larger and larger. And all of a sudden, you have a feeling of being a generation and having some sort of bond with every other teenager on the street. Maybe I feel it's different just because I'm in it. I've never experienced another generation. But I do feel we'll have something to say. We'll make a gigantic splash in the world to come. I get scared when I think too far ahead in the future. I don't, I don't think of myself when I'm 80. I just can't, because when you realize you're going to die, it's the most frightening thing in the world. I know what I'm going to do after I get out of high school. That's all it means to me right now. Well, I don't know, really. <laughs> just that I want to get as much as I can out of life. I mean, I goof around a lot and get in trouble, but I mean, why not if, you know, you don't know what's going to happen the next day or anything? My parents want me in at 12 o'clock, and they don't like me to hang out at some places, like the pub in some places and I just can't take it they act like I'm seven years old you know how parents are they always bug you where you're going when you're getting home who you went with what time you're going to be back don't stay on the phone too long so what do you do you try to get out of it you try to get your own phone you're going to pay your own bills all right fine then you get your own car and you're free a little bit but he's still holding on the rope then you wait till you're 18 and that comes the day boy when you get 18 you really get it they try to decide for us what we should do and what we shouldn't and uh, they're telling us what to do from their experiences. And uh, the only real way that we're going to learn uh, not to or to do something is to learn from our own experiences. And they're trying to stop us from doing this. New sin replaced the old. The older generation's problem in defending their culture was similar to the church's problem of the past century, when their Christian faith was challenged by emerging philosophies. Children of the new generation were turning away from their parents. And poised at the brink of this social tidal wave was a man who promised order in the midst of chaos, peace in the midst of conflict, sanity in the midst of psychedelia. To the cynical, politically correct unbelievers of today, he would have been considered merely a spiritual pied piper offering to bring the children back from darkness. To the church-going, God-fearing and terrified parents and grandparents of the 60s and 70s, he appeared to be a godsend. This man was Bill Gothard. I even... Uh, tried to write a, a master's thesis on the answer. And I, um, I didn't get it. I got some ideas. I didn't get the real answer, though. And um, it's a very important question because it's the last command that was given to us by the Lord Jesus. He said, go into all the world. That all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So the question is, how do you know when you've made a disciple? Bill Gothard was born November 2, 1934, in Illinois, to parents William and Carmen. In the 1950s, Bill began his career as a youth minister. While in college, Bill was described as a reclusive young man that kept to himself. His colleague, Samuel Schultz, wrote the following, quote, He was reclusive throughout his college career, seeming to shun the limelight with his picture appearing in only one yearbook. He spent a lot of his time in solitary prayer. At one point, he devoted 35 hours per week to youth work at a Chicago Missionary Society while being a full-time student at Wheaton College 25 miles away. One day, some of his fellow youth workers confronted him, saying they detected spiritual pride in him, mostly because they were jealous of his popularity, as he became a youth minister favored quickly by many. He became convinced that their accusations were true and confessed it to one of his fellow workers. That person dealt harshly with him and advised him to confess the sin to several, including the head of the missionary society for which Gothard worked. Gothard's boss fired him shortly after his confession. In 1964, shortly after he was fired, Gothard was invited to teach a course on youth ministry at Wheaton College. 
The materials he presented at the time became the foundation for his seminars. By 1968, Gothard created the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts, which is now known as the Institute of Basic Life Principles, the IBLP. Gothard traveled all over speaking to various churches, and in all of his teachings, parents began taking their children to his seminars. One of the joys of being here this week is knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have for every one of you the answer. Bill Gothard presented himself and his teachings as the solution to the problems of youth conflict. It was this movement that was populated by a lot of families who wanted something better for their kids. They wanted to avoid a lot of the problems that they saw in kind of the post-60s uh, cultural landscape of the country. And what Bill Gothard offered was uh, a lot of solutions and he he made a lot of big promises about the results of his program, the success of his programs, kind of the good things that you would have in your life, your family, your business, your church, if you follow his principles. In the middle of all the upheaval and rapid change that characterized the 60s and early 70s, fearful parents who were just trying to raise decent and successful children were desperate for direction. Here was Gothard. It was simple. His worldview was one word, authority. Here we find the statement that uh, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft or idolatry. <clears throat> you are either operating in a life of yieldedness and submission, or you are operating in rebellion. God's word. <clears throat> would have us understand the importance of this matter of submission, this matter of recognition of God's established authorities in our lives. It's very important that we see why this is so important. So when the scripture says that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, what is it saying? It's saying that if we are not functioning correctly under authority, we are in rebellion. And if we are in rebellion, we open ourselves to satanic influence just as surely as if we participated in witchcraft. That's how serious it is. If we do not recognize God's ways and established authorities in our lives, and we purposefully and deliberately move out from under them, and we do not recognize them, and we resist them and we rebel against them, we are directly opening ourselves to a world that God never wants us to experience. The three basic purposes for authority. <clears throat> the first being protection from destructive forces. There are three basic purposes for authority in our lives. <clears throat> One being this matter of protection from destructive forces. <clears throat> This is particularly true in the uh, area of family eh, authority. Uh, your parents and my parents were very concerned about three levels of protection for us. Number one, <clears throat> they were concerned about our friends. True? Huh? How many uh, <clears throat> points of conflict did you have with your parents over your friends? Probably every kid in here has had that and probably all of us had it one time. Why? Well, there was a reason. They, uh, they wanted to protect us from perceived influences that uh, would be harmful to us. Uh, we thought they were being too narrow. We thought they were being incorrect. No, parents are given abilities to discern and understand by God that certain people in our lives ultimately will be very, very damaging to us. Another area <laughs> is our activities, our activities. There were some activities that uh, your parents did not allow you to participate in. And maybe you uh, thought you were just crafty enough to do them in a way that they didn't know you were doing them. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, you didn't get by with it. 
you are suffering from it right now because you were acting in rebellion when you did that. And we're going to see that that has devastating results, long-term devastating results. Youth were considered defiant and rebellious, and no one could stand up to them or knew what to do with them except Gothard. He had the answer. He promoted the following. The need to obey authority figures God has ordained and the need to follow biblical principles in making every decision. With the youth being persuaded to drop out of school, do drugs, and rebel, Gothard appeared to want to help turn them from their wicked ways and get them on the right path. He was looked at as a savior, a savior of the youth. Took you there, you followed me, you got nowhere. Number one influence in children today is peer pressure. Forty years ago, the number one influence in young people's life were parents. Yeah, parents, number one influence. Forty years ago. <clears throat> the second great influence in children's lives, 40 years ago, were their teachers. Yeah, public school teachers. And usually, those public school teachers reinforce what the parents wanted. Guess who was the third greatest influence in young people's lives 40 years ago? Pastors. Pastors were the third greatest influence in young people's lives 40 years ago. Yeah. I remember the influence of pastors on my life. Hmm? Profound. It's all changed. Today, the number one influence in young people's life is peer pressure. Okay? In the top ten, pastors aren't even on the list anymore. And parents are seventh on the list of influence in young people's lives. <clears throat> Things have changed. The public worshipped Gothard and his organization expanded quickly. His seminars would sell out by the thousand, bringing in between 8,000 to 20,000 people. Tickets to his seminars were $55 for married couples, $45 for general admission, and $35 if part of a church. A few years after his organization was created, the IBLP became a multi-million dollar brand. Gothard teaches that the Christian life is built on a series of seven principles that, if we attain, will bring us ultimate success. He claims that these principles are universal and people will suffer natural and divine consequences for violating them. So what are these principles? The principles are design, authority, responsibility, suffering, ownership, freedom, and success. The design principle. People should understand their specific purpose for which God created them. I said, I think maybe you have a bitterness toward God. And she said, I'm not bitter toward God. 
Now, why would I be bitter toward God and want to be a missionary? I said, yeah, that is a problem. But I said, how long have you resented your height? She said, a couple of years. I said, well, in the final analysis, who made you as tall as you are? And she had to acknowledge she never put two and two together. Finally, she said, well, I guess God made me as tall as I am. And you know, there are many, many today who have a floating bitterness toward God, and they don't even know it. They might be bitter toward just life in general, or they might be bitter toward their parents, or bitter toward circumstances, or bitter toward authority, or bitter toward people, because they don't really accept the way God made them. Number two, the authority principle. It is based on the idea that God gives direction, protection, and provision through human authorities. And for many of us, especially young women in this who went through the basic seminar, we remember the authority principle because through this we learned the umbrella of protection. And the umbrella of protection taught that God had authority through his son Jesus and he gave that authority to men and that women and children fell under men's authority. And if we walked out from under the authority of a man who was in direct connection with Jesus, then you would be open to all sorts of horrible things that could go wrong in your life. Usually we resist, we reject God-ordained authority. We push them away. God warns, the eye that mocks at his father and pushes away his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. That's a very gory scene. The first step of a raven or an eagle coming down upon some carrion, an animal, Slave. The first thing they'll do is go over and pick at the eye. Because if that animal doesn't defend its own eye, it's dead. They know to spot death in the eye. Do you know there are wicked, evil people more and more in our day who are able to look in the eye of a teenager and spot rebellion? And they know exactly how to take advantage of teenagers who have rebellion in their eye. That's why God is warning teenagers, you get off from under authority, and you're exposing yourself to all kinds of destruction and, to, and, uh, and devastation. The young, the ravens, the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall come eat it. Number three, the principle of responsibility. A clear conscience results when people realize they are responsible to God for every thought, word, action, and motive. Part of this principle is asking from, for forgiveness from anyone who is who is ever you have ever offended, so that no one can point a finger at you and say you've offended me and never ask for my forgiveness. Oh. It was like the Lord was saying to me, if you don't obey me in this area of clearing your conscience in these things you have done that I've revealed to you now, then you might just as well put your Christianity up on the shelf because it's not going anywhere. Number four, the principle of suffering. We will suffer for committing to such a high standard of living. The suffering principle is that people should allow the hurts from offenders to reveal blind spots in their own lives. Genuine joy is a result of fully forgiving offenders. Suffering led into Bill Gothard's teaching on sexual assault and abuse, in which he stated that all of sexual assault was created by God to purify you as a person. So I remember as a young teenager looking through the paperwork on what to do if you were sexually abused. And basically, Gothard taught that all of it was in order to make you a better person. And therefore, you should just forgive your offenders. And there was never any mention or concern about reporting your offender and getting justice through the legal system. It was simply about making it so that you felt right with God and forgiving others and victim blaming you. So even if you were a child, Bill Gothard taught that you were not right with God and therefore sexual abuse or abuse itself could make you a better person and therefore it was victim blaming in order to make you feel better with God. Five, we are owned by God and by our fathers. The ownership principle is that people are stewards, not owners of their possessions. Gothard teaches that anger results from not yielding personal rights to God. One day a, a freshman girl said to me, why would God allow me to be born in a family where my mother has been in and out of a mental hospital for 18 years, my father's not a Christian, and all these pressures in our family. And I said to her, 
God has allowed that irritation for you because he wants to build insight and wisdom, character in your life. Why don't you make it your goal to assist your mother in overcoming her mental problems? She said, how can I do that? I said, well, the first thing you do is explain to your mother the one thing that's not been explained to her so far, that she is responsible for her attitudes. She's not a victim. She's responsible for her words, her thoughts, her actions, her attitudes. And when that daughter was in a tactful, loving way, able to help her mother see her own personal responsibility, that mother was able to come to new mental freedom. Six, the more we submit to authority and continually examine our minds for where Satan might be inhabiting us, we will find true freedom. Moral purity is the result of true freedom. The key to freedom is learning how to walk in the spirit and appropriate the victory that Christ has already won through his death, burial, and resurrection. We are told in scripture that if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So the major question comes, how does a person walk in the spirit? Now we want to build a solid foundation here so that we'll be able without any doubt to have complete victory. And seven, all of this brings us true success. Finally, the last principle in these messy principles. The success principle is that when people learn to think God's thoughts by meditating and memorizing scripture, they make wise decisions and fulfill their life purposes. So the success principle dictated that everything went back to scripture. So when you were confused about your future career path, what you should do, should you go on family vacation, should you study science, you know, whatever you question you had in life, Gothard's answer was go back and study more scripture and by memorizing and meditating on the Bible, you will get an answer to whatever question and direction you need in your life. A former IBLP member wrote the following, quote, Mr. Gothard does not teach these wonderful truths which will set us free from the power of sin and to allow the Holy Spirit to empower us to be everything we were meant to be. No, he teaches how to be enslaved to the power and the penalty of sin. By the time you have progressed to the elite home education seminar, he will dictate when to get up in the morning, how to dress, what to eat, what music to listen to, how to use the TV, never, and the newspaper, let others screen it for you, not to use contraceptives, when to have sex with your mate, what colors and styles to use in your dress, how to clean your house, how to check your mail, choice of toys, whether a man should wear a beard or not, how to be cleansed from sin, how to be right with your brothers, friendships, dating, and the list goes on. It's a way of controlling and cloning people. Bill Gothard's personal secretary of more than nine years charged in a 10-page account of personal grievances that he twisted scripture to achieve total control over her mind and emotions. She said he dictated how to compose letters to her parents, her personal nail care, makeup, and dress, which friendships she could develop, whether she could date or marry, and where with whom she spent her free time. Bill Gothard taught the importance of uniformity and appearance and actions by writing the following, quote, When a soldier voluntarily enlists in an army, he surrenders his individual freedom regarding the clothes he wears, the friends with whom he trains, the activities in which he engages, the music to which he marches, and the social life he wants. When the world sees uniformity and quality control of high standards among believers in these areas, they are attracted to the message. Gothard represents himself as having the answers to life's very difficult dilemmas, which he claims can be answered by using his basic life principles. Columnist Bob Norman stated, quote, Gothard doesn't focus on the Ten Commandments. He teaches his seven universal, non-optional principles of life, and he extended those principles to what food to eat and what clothes to wear. Breaking any of Gothard's principles leads to the highway to hell, quite literally. Gothard also gave out medical advice and drilled into parents his stance on circumcision. He wrote, quote, The attack against circumcision in the United States coincided with the revolt against morality and authority in the 1960s. One of the chief reasons given for not having circumcision was that it decreased a man's sensual pleasure. Indeed, uncircumcised men have, as a group, 
been more promiscuous than circumcised men. Because this is one subject which is so strongly commended and reinforced in scripture, there is no question. Gothard teaches wives that rebellious children are the direct result of their own failure to fully submit to their husbands. He suggests that rebellion in children will vanish if the wife gets in line. Hence, everything in a family stands or falls on this issue of authority and submission. This applies no matter how ungodly and wicked or harmful the person in authority may actually be. When the children have become of age, Gothard's structure for authority shifts from the chain of command to the chain of counsel. He believes that no one should go against parental counsel, no matter how old the child is or how ungodly the parents may be. He even suggests that unless they have parental consent, adult single children should remain at home. Gothard's strict rules apply even to courtship, as he teaches that young people must allow their authorities to determine whom they'll marry and that God can bless no marriage if it goes against parental counsel. He added, quote, I'm firmly convinced that God never intended girls to turn down dates. He intended for their fathers to. In his book, Establishing Biblical Standards of Courtship, there's a page for sons and daughters to sign with their fathers. It is a covenant that promises their commitment to the courtship process. The young lady must say to her father, quote, I will wait for your full release before entering into marriage. The father in turn tells his daughter, quote, I will protect you from unqualified men. To his son, the father says, quote, I will protect you from strange women. Once the father gives the suitor the green light, Gothard teaches that the courtship should be as short as possible. One may ask the question, well, how will the couple really get to know each other if the process is so hasty? Gothard's response was, quote, the proper way to get to know the young lady is by building a relationship with her father. He continues, quote, courtship is a father's agreement to work with a qualified young man to win his daughter for marriage. He is absolutely opposed to dating and banned it within his organization, writing, through the deception of dating, Satan is able to reduce the fruitfulness of one's ministry, both in singleness and in marriage. It is not natural for a Christian to put anything before loving God with all their heart, soul, mind and strength and girls with our minds we really struggle with living in a fantasy world yeah you with me we fantasize about who we're gonna marry and oh does does he like me does she like me and we get so caught up sometimes when really we need to be studying to show ourselves approved unto God and focus on loving God and serving Him and realizing that, you know what? It's not our place to find a mate. It's God's place. And there is nothing as wonderful as being pursued by the one that loves you because if you pursue Him and you get Him to like you back, what are you going to do when you're married? When you're married and you have a lot of little ones, do you want a husband that's going to pursue you and love you and be interested in the things you're interested in? Well, then wait and step back and guard your heart and let him pursue you and pursue your parents and pursue God. Gothard also created a medical institute for his followers called the Medical Training Institute of America, a program designed to help members assess their medical health decisions. One of his teachings was his belief that Cabbage Patch dolls caused mothers who had come full term in their pregnancies to be unable to deliver until the homes were cleansed from evil influences. The customers were standing in front of this store at 7 o'clock this morning. The store didn't open until 9, and only a few Cabbage Patch dolls were going on sale. Once the coupons were given out to those few parents who would be allowed to buy a doll, The word was given out that the dolls would be given out behind the store, out back at the freight entrance. In his booklet, a midwife told the following stories. She said, quote, At one birth, the mom had been in labor for two or three days with no signs of problems for the mother or baby, but no progress. This was baby number five. The Lord prompted me to ask them about any items in their home through which Satan could gain entrance to interfere. There was a Cabbage Patch doll in their home. They threw it outside and agreed to burn it when they could get a fire going. Within two hours, this mom had a beautiful son. In the home of another born-again Christian couple, they had a rebellious daughter and lots of trolls in addition. This mom was not dilating well. I had seen one troll dial in the bathroom. They agreed to get rid of any they had. Out went the trolls. 
This family had their first successful home birth that morning. <laughs> Things have reached such a point that this store in Clifton, New Jersey, has set up a Cabbage Patch trading post. They decided it doesn't matter much that the doll retails for $21 if you can't buy one. So they'll pay you $40 for any Cabbage Patch doll you bring in, and then they'll turn around and sell it for $50. You just spent $50 for a doll that cost $20. True. Should have cost $20. Should have cost $20, right. Why? Because by the time I go looking in the stores, it'll cost me $30 in gas and aggravation. This is what all the fuss is about. Why are full-grown adults fighting over these? Well, here's one reason. I want to get it. Josh Howell, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Oh, 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 oh. And I had this Cambridge Patch Kid doll. Rest in peace. <laughs> Zachary. I remember, like putting him in a box with all my He-Man and my She-Ra and my Care Bears, because those are evil too, and carried him out to the dumpster and like put him into the dumpster. And I will never forget like walking away from the dumpster and like seeing his little cherubic cabbage patch kid doll face looking at me from the top of the dumpster as I abandoned my first child. So Bill Gothard, in addition to being a is a psycho. He believed the creator of Cabbage Patch Dolls, Xavier Roberts, I believe is his name, is a warlock. Xavier Roberts puts a demon into each Cabbage Patch Kid doll so that when you'd adopt it, you're actually adopting a demon. Bill Gothard also wrote an article in 2000 regarding diseases. He said, quote, Osteoporosis is a disease that causes the bones to deteriorate. Scripture states that envy is the rottenness of the bones, and that a wife that shames her husband is as rottenness of the bones. Gothard claimed that fasting could relieve arthritis and that, quote, anyone who puts himself in the hands of a doctor for major medical care before calling for the elders of the church is making an unwise decision. In Gothard's medical care booklets, he also gives medical advice regarding childbirth. He details how generational sins are passed through C-sections. He writes that, quote, those who are trained in assisting women in childbirth are often unaware that their training is built on presuppositions that are damaging to women. To help women during childbirth, he created a list of correct prayers to pray to ensure a healthy baby. In his booklet titled How to Understand the Causes and the Management of Miscarriages, he wrote a section titled How Robbing God Can Be Related to Miscarriages. In this section, he writes the following, quote, when a couple does not render to the Lord the percentage due to him, a simple token that they all possess belongs to him. He warns that the devourer will be permitted to take from them things they may hold dear. The authors write, quote, In essence, Gothard has successfully caused his followers to fear doctors, to reject medical science, and to greatly fear stepping out of line by misusing and misapplying scripture. They wrap up their investigation with the following excerpt. It is very difficult for people to leave authoritarian religious groups. Those who have never been in such a group often wonder why this is so. The power of propaganda is a powerful tool which entraps many people into a number of groups. Their primary source of what they consider reliable information comes from the group itself. Outsiders are viewed as downright evil and worldly. People who find themselves in this situation become afraid to point out even serious problems they find along the way. It is easy to say those that end up in groups like these are gullible, but it's deeper than that. This next example is a pleasant one, yet fraught with subtle but serious potential for misunderstanding. It deals with the association of text with worldly images. The sounds of this music call to mind a science fiction theme, like Star Trek. Actually, the song is written for children and makes our minds analogous to computers. It has a snappy tune which excites the imagination, and the key focus is that we need to put scripture into our minds because what goes in is what must come out. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Do you hear the sound effects? Think about things that are above, not things that are on the earth. At the same monument that Christ Jesus had. 
That the Bible must be our primary feed. 